We're going to talk about computer assisted cognitive behavioral therapy. And to discuss this, we have with us Dr. Jess Wright. He is an internationally recognized psychiatrist who is the Kolb Endowed Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Louisville. He is also a leading expert and researcher in cognitive behavioral therapy and the lead author of a recent article that was published on February 10th of 2022 titled Effect of Com Computer-Assisted Cognitive Behavioral Therapy versus usual care on depression among adults and primary care, a randomized clinical trial. So Dr. Wright, thank you very much for joining me today. And thank you, Ray. It's a pleasure to be with you. Yeah, so I, I'm really excited uh, to discuss this um, because one thing that we really look for is technology you can use for behavioral health treatment. Uh, telehealth is, is not just providing you know, clinical sessions through video or phone, uh, but, it, but it's really opening up uh, a whole lot of technology we can use for behavioral health. And computer-assisted uh, behavior, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is one of those that's been shown to be effective in working with clients. Um, so yeah, it'd be really interesting to hear how you first kind of got involved in, in this field. Well, I started off with cognitive behavior therapy back, back when it was in its infancy, really. Uh, mm -hmm. I was very fortunate to meet Aaron Beck, who became a mentor of mine and took me under his wing, his very gracious and big wing, uh, and taught me cognitive behavior therapy and helped me get started in my research career. This was back way long ago, uh, in uh, around 1980 or a little before. And uh, in my early days, I was very interested in learning how to use cognitive behavior therapy with more severely mentally ill patients, inpatients, those with severe depression and so forth. Began to write about it, wrote about it with Dr. Beck and others. But then in the early 90s, uh, I got the idea that there might be a way to harness the power of computers, video, multimedia to enhance the psychotherapy process and to help therapists get the job done in a somewhat more efficient way than they ordinarily would. Having learned how to do cognitive therapy, I know that it, it's, even though it's a short-term treatment for most people, it still takes a lot of hours and it takes a lot of effort on everybody's part, the patient's part, the doctor's part, the therapist's part or whatever. Typically what, 15 to 20 hours of therapy. And the idea was to see if we could somehow put together a hybrid method, if you will, not eliminating the human at all by any means. In fact, that's not been a part of my work at all of trying to say, well, a computer is going to do therapy, but to use computer programs to help build skills, teach some of the basic concepts, rehearse patients, help them do so-called homework or action plans, uh, and do some of the routine things that uh, cognitive therapists often have to do. Uh, those that have done cognitive behavior therapy or know about it realize that you have to teach people about what the basic cognitive model is, about things like automatic thoughts, behavioral activation, uh, how to uh, dig down and find out what your core beliefs are and then begin to work with those, modify thoughts, do cognitive restructuring. And so it's in a way, it's a new language for patients and often new skills. And uh, we were able to very early on develop a prototype program, which was titled Good Days Ahead, that um, did do this work. And then I began to do research on it. And I've been fortunate to receive funding from the National Institute of Mental Health for uh, several studies, uh, three major ones that have been so-called randomized trials, where we looked at this new form of treatment, which uh, I call CCBT, or Computerized Cognitive Behavior Therapy, or Computer Assisted cognitive behavior therapy compared to standard treatment. And so now after several decades of research, we pretty much know the answer that this treatment is effective. It's as effective as traditional face-to-face -face or therapy would be delivered by, uh, by telemedicine. And it uh, saves a lot of time. Uh, you can cut the amount of therapist time down by at least a half in our most recent study that you noted, 
the total amount of therapist time was about two and a half hours and very successful outcomes. Uh, and no different than uh, if the therapist had spent the traditional 16, 20 hours with a patient. So the whole idea here is to have therapists be able to treat more people with available time, uh, to reach out, to have better access to treatment. We all know that no matter how many good therapists there are out there, there's still lots of patients that don't get treatment. Lots of people that need access to treatment that aren't getting it. So that's what this research has been all about. about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic. And yeah, I know with this recent uh, article, it shows that it was more effective uh, using the computer-assisted uh, cognitive behavioral therapy rather than what you say, treatment as usual. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what, was, what was the comparison? So what was the you know, computer-assisted CBT compare, in terms of comparing it to treatment as usual? What was that treatment as usual that it was compared to? Yeah, this was a, a real world study. Uh, sometimes researchers get criticized for being in an ivory tower where they have all these exclusion criteria and filters for people to get in and out of the study. So in this particular study, which was done in a primary care setting with people that were going to see a general practitioner or a family physician, uh, we tried to make the filters very large. In other words, almost anybody could get into the study as long as you had a a, a minimal level of depression and you were the, the CCBT or computer assisted therapy was compared with the usual care people got in a primary care practice, which could include anything the doctors or the other therapists that worked in the practice would want to do with the patients or the patients could get, including medications and psychotherapy, other psychotherapies. It turned out that the amount of other treatment, medications or psychotherapy was identical in the patients that had usual care compared to computer-assisted therapy. This is essentially an add-on study. If you added on computer-assisted therapy to what people traditionally get in a primary care setting, did you get a benefit? And the answer was a resounding yes. Mm. So when you say you get a benefit, you're, you're, you're saying they, were, they, were, they had equal results, right? In this particular study, the... Um, the remission rate was more than double in people that received the computer-assisted cognitive behavior therapy. Yeah, so that's the response a significant. Rate, almost yeah. double. Yeah, very significant. Very significant yeah, difference. Yeah, yeah significant uh, improvement of care. Right. Um, but yeah. it sounds like the, the treatment as usual was really varied. I mean, it could have been where they weren't receiving any psychotherapy at all, right? They were just seeing their right. primary yeah. care physician. So how does, how does the uh, computer-assisted... Um, CBT compared to CBT provided by a therapist, say with, uh, you know, yeah, on-site so services. We have, we have to step, we stepped back one study. So I've done a series of these studies and mm -hmm. the study right before this was done uh, at the University of Pennsylvania and at the University of Louisville, where I work and statistical analysis at other places, University of Pittsburgh and University of London. And uh, in that study, there was a head-to-head -head standard CBT 20 up to 20 hours of treatment with a computer assisted therapy in which the amount of contact with the therapist was reduced by two thirds. So mm. this was a, again, a head to head trial. Uh, the patients had to be drug free. So there were no medications used. It was a very well controlled study. Mm -hmm. And in that study, the, uh, the two treatments were identical. There were both treatments worked great and there mm. were no differences in outcome. So what we were able mm. to show was that you could use this hybrid model of human plus computer, and it was very effective and it um, saved a lot of time and also saved a lot of money. The economic analysis was very much in favor of computer assisted therapy. Right, and what about a study where you just, uh, you eliminate the, the person, like the therapist, and just uh, have computer assisted? Well, I have not done those myself, but we did publish a couple of years back a meta-analysis where we looked at all the available studies in the whole world and we found 40 of them were very high quality for depression. And in those, the evidence for computer alone being effective was tiny. The effect was very small. Uh, whereas the effect, if, if the hybrid model of human clinician reduced time with the computer program was very robust. So mm -hmm. I take from that that it, for most people and in most situations, at least with, with available technology, 
uh, maybe sometime in the future, there'll be better ones, but with available technology that uh, the best results are uh, human plus computer, not computer alone. Well, one thing I'm suspicious about that is the utilization of just using the computer assisted CBT. Um, if you do not have the therapist you know, involved, I wonder what that utilization was like in those studies that you looked at. Because when people use apps, they often just kind of browse and check out the app, but they don't stick with it. They don't actually, you know, follow through with it on a daily basis and do the work. Um, whereas when you add that therapist piece or any, it doesn't even have to be a therapist. I'm thinking we had anybody involved who's checking in with the person and keeping them going, keeping them on track. Seems like I'm wondering if, if that's the piece that really uh, improves the effectiveness. Any, any thoughts on that? Uh, well, a very good point, Ray, and it's still a bit of an open question. There have been studies that have looked at if the support is from a therapist versus a technician, a person who's not trained as a psychotherapist, but gives time to the patient, is supportive, answers questions, mm -hmm. helps promote their involvement with the computer program, the results can be pretty good. But this is still, mm -hmm. this is, this, that part of the research is in its infancy. More needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Personally, having done a lot of this and, and used the treatment myself with lots of patients, I'm pretty skeptical that um, a, 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 a clinician or a, a helper with no clinical experience is going to be as good as someone who just uh, reminds the patient to do the program. Uh, it, it may turn out that way, but uh, of course, I'm a therapist myself. I, I'm not a, a, just a pure researcher. And it would be hard for me to accept the fact that everything I've learned and everything I do with patients is of, of little value compared to what a machine can do. Right. And, and so the, the platform that you used for this like recent study, how would it compare to say Wobot, you know, Facebook's Wobot? Uh, yeah. Thanks for asking that question. <clears throat> Wobot and uh, there's some other programs uh, that are so-called chatbots are very interesting. They use some artificial intelligence to try to respond to whatever a user wants to put into the program and make some sense of it and, and give some guidance and feedback. And they're pretty nifty, but none of them are really set up to do full bore psychotherapy in the sense that you and I or our listeners might understand psychotherapy to be. I see them more as a, uh, a nice adjunct that you can recommend to patients if you think that they might be able to benefit from it. Headspace is another one. Uh, I have some apps that I recommend. Uh, I recommend some of the Department of Defense apps like uh, uh, the Virtual Hope Box, which is free. It's, it's a nice app and some people use it a bit. My sense is that most patients, like you say, pick them up, take a look, maybe play around with them a little bit, but they don't become a fundamental part of their effort to re get recovery from whatever it is they're trying to work on, whether it's depression, anxiety disorders, PTSD, or whatever, that they, they really need a, a more comprehensive and engaging kind of a program. Uh, Good Days Ahead, the program that we've done research on, has uh, nine lessons, and it takes the patient through all the core methods and and skill building exercises that one ordinarily would do with somebody with depression. Um, the outcomes actually been good for anxiety too. It turns out that it works very well for anxiety. And there are other, there are other programs that are available that are out there. Um, and so it's not just that this program is, is the only one that one can pick up and use that I, I would I vouch for. Some of the older ones are uh, Beating the Blues. You may have heard of that, Mood Gym. Uh, they're, they're available for a relatively small cost for what value they offer. And um, there are other one, newer ones that are being developed. The, one of the questions is, is AI or artificial intelligence going to enhance these programs and make them more relatable, more like uh, a real therapist would do that have built in some of the wisdom, empathy, sensitivity, cultural awareness, customization, and so forth that a therapist can do. I'd say right now, they really, the, the computer programs and apps really aren't at that level. Maybe right. someday. 
Yeah, it well, it's yeah, it's rapidly evolving. The artificial, not just the artificial intelligence, uh, but the remote monitoring. So it, it's kind of like the thought of what if you, as the therapist, were walking around with your client every day throughout all of the activities of their day, and as you notice cognitive distortions or you know irrational thoughts or thoughts that you can help them work on or, and behaviors. If you, if you said, Hey, let, let's talk, you might, if we talk about this for a second and then you review it right there and then, and then they can take action right there and then, uh, to, to correct those things. And, and it's ongoing, right? It's always right there with them, a part of their day-to-day operations, the same devices they use. Um, yeah. So I think that's, I think that probably is where, uh, things are going in terms of the AI, uh, capability. We'll see if that's something that, that patients want. Right. <laughs> it's more valuable that, to have it's like a therapist that plugged into your ear all day long. I don't know if I'd want that if I was in therapy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hopefully kind of, the, the patient would have the ability to adjust that up and down. Right, right. Yeah. Them. Yeah. The um, yeah, like the the remote monitoring that they're that they're developing currently is where you know, that the user gets to choose what's monitored or not. Right. Like, can you monitor my my movement or my sleep or my breathing or my blood pressure and my, the uh, conductivity of my skin or, you know, all these kind of yeah, things. It my... could, could seem a bit intrusive, couldn't it? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. If someone yeah, really... every last aspect of your life. Right. Right. Again, we yeah. have to wonder how many people are going to want that level of um, surveillance. Yes. Yes. Um, and what, so... and the other question is, is what happens to the data? Uh, who has yeah. control of this data? Is it sold? Is it is it confidential? Is it, well, right. where does it go? So users of these things, I, I recommend this to therapists. Before you ask a patient to use something, check it out yourself and and see if you think it's safe and reliable and presents good messages, things that you think are going to be helpful to people. Uh-huh. There are thousands of apps, and uh, one, one recent paper that I read found that the vast majority of apps that purport to be for mental health or therapy or whatever are written by people who have no uh, no training in psychology or social right. work or psychiatry or they're just uh, you know a developer that says okay i can take this self-help book or whatever and try to put some of it in digital format and see how it goes see if i can make some money out of it so you have to be a little skeptical right yeah and uh so that's what um really interested me in uh, the article that you recently, you know, were a, a lead author of is uh, the research on, on the application, because we want to look at uh, our applications evidence-based exactly. and yeah. And that's difficult. So CBT is, you know, one of the most researched therapeutic methods. Um, and so it seems a little, a little bit easier maybe to, to study it. Uh, there may be some other uh, therapy styles or, or techniques. Um, so, yeah, in, in terms of the evidence-based and, and using applications like this, is, any thoughts you want to share on that? Uh, sure. Um, I think we do have to be careful in seeing if there's research that backs up these devices that we're suggesting people use. And um, some of the claims that this is based on research it's really based on research that other people have done uh, and research on CBT that shows that CBT is an effective treatment instead of research done on that particular app or uh, on a, on a, on a, on a full, both full bore computer program. So one piece of advice I would give is to try to look up the research on it. If you want to make it part of your package of things you recommend to patients. Uh, the particular program that, that I helped develop and tested has been rigorously researched. I feel real confident about it. I know what it does and what it doesn't do. Uh, I know how acceptable it is and how we have had essentially no adverse events throughout many years of research. So I think it's safe. And uh, I know that the data is a data integrity as far as confidentiality and security is at the top rank. Uh, But I couldn't say that necessarily for every program that's out there. Right. And in terms of the research you've done and looking at the details, um, it's not just recommending that the client uses this application, uh, but the research 
that you've done says that if they complete the program, right? If they complete those, was it nine modules? And, and they had the additional pieces of kind of check-ins uh, with the clinician. So yeah, looking at the details of the research is uh, probably also important uh, if you want to, you know, say that it's uh, evidence-based. Sure, uh, if you, you want to go on what the evidence really says, uh, a modicum of clinician support uh, and getting through at least a good piece of a computer program would be seen to be things that would predict better outcomes. Um, there, that, that's one of the, the, the problems that's, that we've seen with computer-assisted therapy research and app research is the take-up rate and the completion rate. And in right. one study, we, the meta-analysis, we did find that the completion rate did affect the outcome. That you might you, you would anticipate that would be the truth. That the more people, more time people spend on the program, the better they were going to do with it. Right. Yes. And uh, you would say that you can't just cast the net that you know one compute because there's different computer-assisted CBT programs out there, I suppose. Yes. Um, so uh, this, this one was shown to be effective based upon this research uh, provided in this particular way. Um, so any thoughts on, can we cast the net? You know, can we say, well, this, this was shown to be effective. Therefore, these other CBT applications uh, are also effective to use in therapy. I think you have to be a little careful about that because there are different methods of delivery and different types of computer programs. Some actually are old fashioned text only, no video or interactive kinds of things going on. They're pretty much just like reading a book, but reading it online. And uh, some of them have been found to be pretty useful, but I think that most users now would want something more modern and more interactive and more stimulating and engaging than just reading a lot of text, particularly if you were using with a person with deep depression, which as mm -hmm. you know, is there's a lot of problems with concentration, energy, uh, sticking with projects. Uh, so uh, I, I think that something that's really easy to use and has a lot of vitality and engaging qualities to it, it's probably going to have a better ability to have the patient stick with it, get something out of it, and, uh, and then eventually have a, have a good outcome. Right. Yes. So what advice do you have for clinicians to utilize uh, this technology with their clients? Like, what should they look for? When would it be appropriate? When would it not? Um, how often should they check in with clients? Uh, what, what would that setup look like? Or what, what would you recommend in that regard? I can answer from the research perspective and then also from just the clinical perspective, having done mm -hmm. this myself. Because when you do a research study, you have to uh, come up with a sort of a general program or plan and test that out to see if that works. And that's what we've done. So from the research perspective, we'd say that at least with a good days ahead program, that having um, weekly sessions abbreviated, typically 20 minutes, uh, not the typical hour long or 50 minute session um, and uh, checking in with the patient. You can do that by phone. You could do it by telemedicine, uh, by Zoom. Uh, that's, that's what I do now. And uh, then the therapist, if they're doing this the best way, signs on and, and becomes a user of the program themselves and can track the progress. So with the Good Days Ahead program, the therapist has is a clinician module. They can see the patient's progress. They can look at all their interactive exercises. They can see where they're having troubles, where they're getting it, where they're not getting it. And then they can, you can, the therapist can pull that up and then use that to guide the session. So the patient gets the most out of it. So that way the computer element and the human element are really integrated nicely instead of they're just being separate kind of things go do the computer program and then we'll just do our usual kind of session so but in clinical practice i think you can vary this a lot of different ways i have some patients that are they're not deeply depressed they they want to learn some things about cbt they're pretty motivated and they can do a lot of the program faster than the typical once a week type lesson and uh, i've had to spend sometimes less time with them I've had other patients which are much more severely ill, uh, lots of psychomotor retardation, troubles with concentration. And I'm slowing down the, the program using it. Uh, I'm maybe spending a couple of sessions with them just to get them comfortable with talking with me 
and getting more history before I launch into use the computer program. So I, what I say is for clinicians to use your clinical judgment. You know what you're doing with these things and know how to integrate other tools like other self-help tools uh, and, uh, and you just use your good judgment. But do get to know the program if you possibly can. You can for most of these, you can order a demo and the person, you can get that for free and take a look and see if you think it'd be good for your patients and you like to like to use it in your program and that leads you to in your therapy and uh, know a little bit about the research and uh, then try it out and uh, go back to the drawing board. It doesn't always work the first time. What you will find is that uh, not every response is uniform. We get on, on the whole, patients like these programs, they give them good ratings and they do well, but you're going to see some people that just don't like it at all. They're going to say, gee, you know, the last thing I want to do is work on a computer program. I really need to talk with you. I, I need that very desperately, depending upon their issues or, or how they're built psychologically. You'll find other patients, and we've seen in our research studies, that they have a, like a session or two with a therapist and they start using the computer program and they say, you know, I don't really want to go to any of those therapy sessions any longer. I just assume, just let me work on this computer thing. I think I'm getting enough. They're extremely self-reliant. Uh, they're uncomfortable with the idea of getting so-called dependent on a therapist. And they, they like the idea a whole lot of having the independence to work on the program uh, pretty much by themselves. And, but the, most of the people are in the middle that they'll, they'll uh, utilize the, the computer program and the clinician work, and we'll see the value of blending them all together. Yeah, that's such an important point that it's, it's not a one size fits all figuring out what works for that client, what are their preferences. And, you know, I've heard of other studies that show that having a structured approach really helps with outcomes. Um, so, I, I, you know, this seems like a, a good structured approach and maybe even helps the therapist keep structured with the kind of nine modules. Have you found that to be the case? We've certainly seen that in research that the therapists that have come to be our research therapists in their clinical practices are much less structured. Uh, they sort of do whatever seems like the right thing to do. And they may not be, in the case of cognitive behavior therapy, they may not be delivering it in the way that it's supposed to be done or delivering it in, in the classic way. So if you use computer-assisted therapy with a program like Good Days Ahead, you can almost guarantee that the patient's going to get a standard dose of the core elements of cognitive behavior therapy. So no matter what else the therapist does, whether it's grief work all the time or uh, supportive work or whatever it might be, um, they're going to get this component of the treatment. And we think that that's a value, uh, that, that that kind of structure helps. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, Dr. Wright, thank you very much. This is very helpful. And, uh, and can, can clinicians and clients, is, is the uh, app available to the public for people to uh, use? Yes, it is. Uh, uh, Good Days Ahead is, uh, is a full computer program for, uh, for use in psychotherapy. It's available as a mobile app, uh, but also you can use it on a, on a uh, laptop or a desktop or a pad, notepad, or whatever you'd like to use it on. A lot of patients actually like to sit down and, and spend some time, 15, 20 minutes or a little longer, almost as if it's their therapy session with a computer instead of doing it on the fly. But Again, there are differences. Some people would like to pick it up and use it on their on their iPhone just occasionally here and there all through the day. Others would like to have a full screen with a full keyboard to type in. Um, so you just, uh, again, one size isn't going to fit all. So try to customize it to meet the needs of your patients. But it is available, yes. Yeah. I have one more, one more question about insurance reimbursement. Uh, so say I'm the clinician. I'm using Good Days Ahead. Um, a part of my time is going to be reviewing the, the progress and, and the reporting of the good days ahead, you know, the, of the client's use of, of the app. And then a portion of the time is going to be doing, you know, working with the client for, for like what you recommended about 20, 25 minutes. Uh, so in terms of insurance reimbursement, would a clinician say bill for a 30 minute session? And part of that session would be reviewing the, uh, the reporting from the app and the rest of it would be working with the client. Any, any thoughts on that? Insurance, well, you, insurance reimbursement is always an issue. I can tell you what I do as a psychiatrist. And that is that I bill for the time I spend with a patient, but the time I spend with a patient, I'm also 
pulling in, I can pull up the computer program, take a look at it, just like I do with my electronic medical record, or if I might access some lab studies that come in or meds that come in from other doctors. That's the world we live in now. We live in a digital world, and this comes into our sessions with the patients. It's a different kind of thing than when Freud started out and sitting back, uh, not even making eye contact with the patient and making notes, I suppose, on a pad. We, we do it now digitally. And so I think it's legit to bill for the time you spend with the patient. Uh, the computer programs themselves are not yet covered by insurance. I hope they will someday be covered by insurance. Although if you're working in some systems, uh, they purchase licenses so that uh, everyone, that all the therapists that work in a system can access these programs and utilize them with patients. Again, they're not vastly expensive. Uh, some therapists uh, decide to uh, pass along the cost of the software to patients who pay a small amount to have that. And by using the software, their, their overall cost of therapy may go down somewhat. So that's usually the way it's handled. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Wright. I appreciate it. And thank you, Ray. It's been great talking with you.